The United States needs to listen to both the Arab, what Arabs and Israelis are saying. I expected I left these people behind, but when I came to the U.S., to my shock, they were here. Who might not know anything about each other's causes, but they know that they have this solidarity, progressive solidarity, to support each other. Like, no matter what happens to them, no matter even what, how big are the internal conflicts between them, they know that the United States is always there to get things back on track. Hello everyone, you're listening to the Uncommon Sense podcast, a new podcast about the Middle East brought to you by the Jerusalem Center for Foreign Affairs from Washington, D.C. This is Hassan Mansour. And this is Dalia Ziada. We would like to welcome you to our first episode where we will be discussing the geopolitical complexities of the Middle East from an uncommon perspective. By the way, it was Hussein's idea to name our podcast the Uncommon Sense. Hussein, why it is uncommon? Because, uh, hopefully, not for long, hopefully it becomes common, but because we want to represent a voice, a united voice, uh, of a new vision for the future of the Middle East that rests upon Arab-Israeli partnership and uh, uh, cooperation for the collective good of the entire region. Hopefully, it will be a region that is post-conflict, post-Arab Spring, post-ideology, uh, post-Islamism, hopefully one day post the Islamic Republic. Wonderful. So this takes us to the topic of our first episode, which uh, will be about uh, the American perceptions of the Middle East and the Middle East perceptions of the United States, which the word perceptions also includes misperce misperceptions, which unfortunately has been many in the past few years. Actually, I want to start from you. So you arrived to the United States very recently, I think in November last year. Uh, what, what did you see when it comes to uh, uh, your, obviously your work with, with Middle Eastern Affairs? Uh, what, what, what shocked you uh, when you came here? Oh, honestly, Hussein, I was really shocked. Uh, you know, in the aftermath of October 7 and the start of Israel-Hamas war... Which is why was, you left Egypt. Which, unfortunately, is why I was forced to leave Egypt, simply because I said that Hamas is a terrorist organization and should not be tolerated, and that Israel is leading a war on behalf of the entire region against not only Hamas, but all the Iran-sponsored terrorists in the region, which we are seeing happening right now. Mm -hmm. But let me get back to the point in November when I first arrived to the United States thinking that I left behind the bad guys, I left behind the Islamists, the extremists, the people who believed that peace is not the solution and we should always be in war with Israel for the good of the region, the people who, who, who are still fighting until now uh, under religious flags and claiming that this is in service of Islam and in service of the God of the Arabs to kill all the Jews. I expected I left these people behind, but when I came to the US, to my shock, they were here. The same people, the same ideologies, the same ideas are occupying the American streets, are occupying the American universities. I really cannot understand what's going on. So you've been here for 12 years now, Tell me what's happening, how the United States became so radical. I, I, I wouldn't say the United States came so radical. I think the, the vast majority of, the, of, of Americans still remain um, in, in where they are in terms of their basic commitments to um, um, or understanding of the Middle East. They, they support Israel. Uh, they want to see peace um, in the Middle East. I think the problem is it's a very visible problem because uh, it's primarily happening in the universities and college campuses. Uh, especially elite schools and elite universities, almost uh, the bigger the university you go to, the bigger the problem is. And you see this, uh, of course, this radical explosion, which is really not new. I think, I think we're just, uh, it, it's, uh, it's been very severe in intensity throughout this past year, since the beginning of the war on, in, uh, in Gaza. Uh, but it's not new. Uh, and it existed for a while, and it has a lot of elements to it that just it's really hard to discuss uh, in, in full in such a very short time. Uh, you have the issue of foreign influence through foreign funding that's been going to universities in order to channel uh, the scholarship into a specific direction when it, when it comes to Middle East departments specifically, who've been really radical since the 1970s. 
uh, you will see actually uh, this is happening. You'll see all the elements that have to do with the radicalization in academia uh, mm -hmm. throughout the social sciences, not just the Middle East. You will see them first in its most in their most radical form in the Middle East, the foreign funding that came from uh, foreign governments. Um, that sought to uh, advance a particular political agenda. Uh, you see the uh, beginning of the radicalism with post-colonial theory and Edward Said, and that's a, that must be seen as an autonomous intellectual development. So there are a lot of people who insist on reducing this to money coming from those Arab, wealthy Arabs. That's a, a complete simplification and reduction, that some of this are autonomous developments that have to do with American higher, higher education uh, uh, institutions themselves and American intellectual life. And, the, and, and Edward Said um, and post-colonial theory in general mm. and identity politics uh, was part of that. And part of it, of course, is the rise of a new distinctive form of American Islamism that started with immigrant groups uh, mm. uh, that transferred some of the uh, organizational logic of the Muslim Brotherhood into um, the growing community of, of American Muslims. Um, and then, of course, they changed with the society itself. I think also it's a mistake to assume that they are still some sort of foreign element to American society. I think, no, they became part of American society. Mm. Um, and you, you get this form of American Islamism uh, that allied itself with this atmosphere of radicalism, um, especially uh, on the university. And that's kind of uh, what you get on, on the university in terms of this progressive radicalism. It's very interesting what you're saying because actually what I saw in the Egyptian streets, in the Arab world, and how the Muslim Brotherhood used this pro-Palestine or the Palestinian cause rhetoric or narrative yeah. to promote their agenda, I can see it happening exactly the same way here in the United States right now. The same tactics, the same strategies, even the same tools used to mobilize supporters and organize prote protesters. It's, it's really interesting how they are using the same playbook they used in the Middle East, now they are using in the United States. And also it's not good to say that unfortunately it's working. It's working, it's still working here in the US because I would tell you from my own experience I understand that some of the young people, especially in the undergraduate stage in universities, they have the need to feel that they are part of something bigger than themselves. Yeah. You know, when I was an undergraduate student myself in my uh, undergraduate years in Cairo, it was around the time of the uh, second intifada. If you remember, it was a of big course. deal. Of course, yeah, yeah, It yeah, was yeah. a big it, deal. It was the wave before this one. Exactly. Yeah. I remember, like, you know, my brother was all the time wearing this kofi and walking right. around everywhere like Al this. Al Jazeera was... came to fame during that same time. Exactly. Right. I was participating in the protests in yeah. the university, and so we were showered by footage from Al Jazeera all the time. Yeah. I live a deja vu now. It's yeah. all happening exactly right now yeah. in the U.S. What I cannot really understand about what's happening on campuses and also in American streets, not only in, inside the campuses, we've seen protests yeah. outside the White House, for example. But what's really interesting for me is that the people who are joining these protests are not only the Islamists, or, yeah. or, and they are not only just young people who want to feel yeah. bigger, uh, feel part of something bigger than yeah. themselves. Actually, some of them are like white Americans uh, people from the LGBT community, people yeah. you would never think they would be supportive of this Islamist ideology. Some of them are even atheists yeah. and secular. But, but that's, that's the thing, they, they, they are not supportive. They don't think of it as supportive of the of Islamist ideology. The problem here is a distinctively American problem. It's a, it's a distinctively American brand of politics called intersectional politics. And the very point of intersectional politics is to create this coalition um, who might not know anything about each other causes, but they know that they have this solidarity, progressive solidarity, to support each other. What we're talking about here, we're talking about the Islamists, the leftists, uh, the, the left, yeah, yeah, left, yeah, yeah. The, the progressive okay. left, yeah. And, and this is so. This is new, uh, but the relationship between Islamism and the left actually goes back. You know, it, it has a very long history. Uh, I think its m most famous episode was actually the Iranian Revolution itself. And anybody so knows. It's not new. It didn't start it's not in new. 2020, huh? No, it's not new. Um, it, it goes back, it goes way back. And there are a lot of intellectual and ideological affinities between both groups. 
the uh, animosity towards the uh, nation state, for instance, the thinking that the West is primarily an imperialist world order that needs to be uh, uh, dismantled, deconstructed, so on and so forth. So they do have a lot of deep intellectual affinities. They have a history of cooperation. The Iranian Revolution happened through a coalition of Islamists and leftists. U ultimately, the leftists are the Islamists are the ones who assume power. And in my own in my own historical perspective in the Middle East, modern Islamism, a, a, a lot of not all of it. Modern, a lot of modern Islamism actually came out of the left. And that's, I think that's a completely missed historical perspective because nobody looks seriously at the intellectual history of, of the Middle East. But, but modern Islamism, a lot of its actual uh, movement, especially since the 1970s, were a development out of the, what was the discredited uh, left, third worldist left at the time. But let's leave the universities for now. Let's actually now move to a, a, the US foreign policy establishment. Hmm. Uh, you're a leader of an Egyptian think tank. You've been an, an activist in Egyptian politics. You're, you're quite well known in Egypt uh, for, for quite some time. Uh, you've been active you know, throughout the years, even before the Arab Spring, throughout the Arab Springs, after, after the, you know, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood to power, throughout <laughs> the time that the Muslim Brotherhood were removed from power, the rise of... You, you've lived through a lot. You. Uh, how did you see you yourself there through that time? How did you experience U.S. foreign policy? Uh, uh, throughout all of these things? It has never been the same over these years. It, it has gone through fluctuations, waves of ups and downs about how, first of all, how the Arabs looked at the United States as an, sometimes as an ally, sometimes as a protector, sometimes as... Uh, You're talking about the Arab states. The Arab states mainly, yeah. yeah. And also uh, this could somehow apply to Israel at certain stages, but I think you can speak better about this point. But from an Arab perspective, Arabs always looked at the United States as their pistol lie, as their protector, as their uh, guarantor of their security. Like no matter what happens to them, no matter even what, how big are the internal conflicts between them, they know that the United States is always there to get things back on track. Unfortunately, in the past 10 years, this was not the case. In the past 10 or 15 years, the perceptions in the Middle East about the United States has changed dramatically for many reasons. Part of it is to be blamed on the US foreign policy in the Middle East because it was not stable. It, it did not follow one line of support to the Middle East interests or the interests of the key countries in the Middle East, while at the same time pressuring for important values like democratization, human rights. And so we saw, unfortunately, like a sense of let down by the US, like mm -hmm. as, if, as if the United States has decided at one moment or another to let down the Middle East, let the Middle East live in its problems. I'm speaking to you, of course, from the yeah, perception yeah. of the region. I don't know how it was here, and I'm curious to hear about that from you. But we have seen, for example, let me quickly like go through the timeline of how these fluctuations has gone. So. At the beginning of the Obama administration, I was actually present in the room when Obama was in Cairo University uh, speaking to the Muslim world uh, a few months after he became a president. And I remember how people were so much in love with Obama. I, I was, and is still honestly, in love with Obama and his legacy, his story. And he really inspired the people there that change is coming, women's rights, human rights. And I used to remember his word when he said, like, you know, we will fight for, we, w the U.S. stands for human rights, not because it is uh, American values, but because it is human values. This was very inspirational, mm. not only in the Arab world, even in Iran, to go to the streets and call for, the, for their human rights, for their women's rights. We saw the Arab Spring happening afterwards. And then we saw a, a very interesting diversion in the U.S. foreign policy towards the Middle East. They stopped looking at the young people who led these democratic movements and wanting to support them, and they instead looked at the Muslim Brotherhood because it was the only organized uh, political group at that time, and they started to support them to lead the post-revolution Arab countries to lead the new era in the Arab world. And this was shocking to many people. 
After and e that, Egypt was at the center of this. Egypt was at the center, as you know, yeah. the Muslim Brotherhood came in power immediately after the revolution, yeah. and the U.S. supported them. The U.S. administration was very supportive to the Muslim Brotherhood coming to the power. Which they saw as a democratic transition. Just uh, uh, th uh, That's how they described sadly, it at least. Yeah, sadly, yeah, sadly, yeah. which was not true at all. I yeah. was on the ground and I was even monitoring the elections that led to the Muslim Brotherhood in, being in, in, in 2012. In 2012, yeah. and it, it was not democratic at all. There were a lot of manipulations. The Muslim Brotherhood are very clever in this regard. Yeah. But then I think there was a sense of disappointment in the Arab Spring and disappointment in the Middle East here in the U.S. administration that led after that to, yeah. uh, to, let's, to this perception of let's leave the Middle East, do yeah. whatever it wants. If it wants dictatorship, let dictatorship happen. If it wants Islamists, let Islamists enjoy themselves. Mm. And we don't care about the Middle East anymore. But unfortunately, this this led to to troubles not only to Middle East countries but also to the United States. And what I really want to understand from you is why the consecutive U.S. administrations did this to us. Why they they did not continue their fight for a better Middle East. So I, I don't know everything. I don't claim to have the answer of all the questions. I can say what I know about about these administration, different administrations and their worldview. And I'm not entirely certain that there was a pivot in Obama policy. I mean, of course, there are developments because of just the real events that happened. But I think there was some in, in, in internal consistency to the worldview that Obama came, came with. So first of all, a lot of these developments uh, happened because of the reaction to the failures of the war in Iraq, the war in Af Afghanistan, it's just the frustration of the American public. There was a will to listen to the engagement of the Middle East that was shared, by, by the way, between Republicans and Democrats. So, Americans on both sides are just tired of the Middle East. For good reasons, we don't have to go into them, it's just it's understandable why they would be. Uh, and there is a, 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 a will to really a, a engage less and commit the United States resources and personnel less to Middle Eastern problems and Middle Eastern securities. But the question is, what is the alternative? How can you manage uh, this reduction? This is what you get really the different policies from the different administrations built on their different worldviews. Um, one of the key figures that helped uh, uh, shape the Obama foreign policy worldview, especially when it comes to the Middle East, was actually Robert Malley, who served as advisor to the Obama campaign even before he, his, his, um, his election, you know, the, the International Crisis Group, to which really the United States later outsourced a lot of its Middle East foreign policy. Um, the International Crisis Group, it has a story how it came, it, it came apart. I wrote a long essay uh, that the, the listeners and, and can, can try to find it about, about the International Crisis Group and Robert Malley. But basically, the view was the United States got it wrong. Islamist movements are social movements. There are some key words uh, here that, that p certain people in the liberal left like to hear. Mm. Uh, they are organic social movements, well-rooted, quote, yeah. um, that really have social services, they have a lot of popular support, they have this, they truly represent a, 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 the popular voice of these, a lot of these Arab populations um, against their U.S. supported autocratic, ty tyrannical, corrupt, you know, old, senile, overweight rulers, which was kind of the, the popular image at the time. Think about the Mubarak uh, generation of, mm. of Arab uh, rulers and presidents. Um, and that's really the forces. These are the young forces that, that really were the future of the region is. And that's what the United States needs to work with. Um, and the International Crisis Group started a dialogue with Hezbollah, for instance. He had an office in, in Syria in already Turkey? in the late yeah. 90s, early 2000s, okay. starting a dialogue with Hezbollah, starting a dialogue with, with Hamas, starting a dialogue with Iran. And that's actually the scandal that happened during the Obama campaign when it was discovered that Robert Malley, I don't remember if he had contact, I, I think he met in person with Hamas figures, and that came down, and then he got fired of the, uh, of the, uh, of the campaign itself. But then he actually came back to the administration after Obama was, was elected, and they really started to craft that worldview that basically Islamist forces, that's the future of the Middle East. Think about also that this is the era in Erdogan, uh, Erdogan's rise, the idea that Isla Erdogan is going to marry Islamism and liberalism. Right. There was a valorization and celebration. Uh, you had people like uh, 
was his name Joe Esposito, here from Georgetown University, the, 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 the chair of the uh, Arab and Islamic Studies, who really was a, a champion of this idea that Erdogan is the future of Islamic liberalism. I remember liberalism. also at that time when everyone was talking about Islam and democracy and, and democracy, how they are yeah. compatible. Qatar was, was, was uh, you, ju you just actually talked about this, Qatar was sponsoring a lot of uh, big forums and events about Islam and democracy, Islam and liberalism, and so on and so forth. And Islam in the West. It's, it's, it's very interesting. It was a very rich period of yeah. Islam, democracy, West, yeah. or Islam and Western values. Like, yeah. they are trying to match Islam to with Western values. Yeah, to say values. that they are compatible, they're going to... At, at, but the, here's, the, here's the thing, it's Islam and Islamists understand it. I just, I want to, I, I want to say, not use this very general term that, you know, keeps getting, a, it's actually, it's a certain understanding of Islam that is as a political force and a political identity um, and a, a, a political platform. That's really the, 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 the specific understanding exactly. of Islam that they meant about this. Exactly. Um, at the same time, you had the European left, that was already happening since the early 2000s, the European left intervened to uh, uh, meditate between the Arab left and the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in order to create an opposition force, which is ultimately going to rise That's in the Arab Spring. You mean the Arab left, the socialists, the, the socialists, Nasserists, Nasserists, the, yeah, oh. the, because they, the traditional enemies with, with, with Islamists, especially during the anti-war movement, during the Iraq war, the European left specifically, and that was very successful in Egypt, the Kifaya movement was formed uh, through that marriage. Yeah. yeah, 2004, 2005. Uh, so you had all of this already happening in the background. So the Obama administration coming with this worldview, and then the Arab Spring happening. Um, so it already it, the, the 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 worldview immediately was translated into policy. You're gonna mm. you're gonna support the democratic democratic transition mm. uh, uh, to these Islamist forces. Now this happened in tandem with the development of the Iran policy that basically wanted to. Um, it saw, in, in Obama's own words, the, the Arabs had to learn to share power with Iran. That's, that's, uh, yes. that's almost a direct yeah. quote that he yeah. said. Um, that basically Iran is a rising power. You can't deny them the amount of power and influence uh, that they have. They're also Islamists, so, you know, social, for, so, uh, so that's the future of the region. Should, which is a chronic American problem looking at all Islamists and all Muslims like one fabric. One, yeah, they yes. are, that's the future of the region. You have yeah. Erdogan, you have the Muslim Brotherhood rising everywhere else. Um, and then you have, and, and you have people like Robert Malley in the administration really advocating a, a for a rapprochement with Iran. Mm. Um, so you get the Iran nuclear deal. And the Iran nuclear deal with a major, major watershed uh, uh, moment of the relationship between the United States and its allies in the region, Israel and, and, uh, and but, the Arabs. But let's jump to the recent years. Yeah. We had the Trump administration, which was very friendly to Arab leaders yeah, and, and even and, empowered yeah. what we call the moderate yeah. Arab countries to fight against the axis of evil, Qatar, right. Iran, and uh, the, maybe the, Pakistan too. Yeah. Against uh, who are sponsors of Islamists. So what happened? Actually, you told me that even Trump administration was not consistent with this. Later on, they changed their position. Yeah. So what's they, how, they were not consistent, for example, in, in their then relation, evolving relationship with Qatar, in declaring them a non-major, a, a, a major non-NATO ally, accepting you know the, the nine billion you know the Emir of Qatar received you know very good treatment here in the White House and so on, but the Trump administration's primary impulse was not much different than that of Obama or Biden later, which is basically the American people want less Middle East in the news. Hmm. The difference is that the Trump administration had a very different vision than the, this very sophisticated, intellectual, uh, a, a unrealistic framework that the Obama administration had, which is basically, we're going to go to our allies. First of all, the way that the Trump administration saw the world, they, they saw it in a traditional American sense. There is American power and its allies, and there are camps that are anti-American. And, and Iran is anti, a part of that anti-American camp. So these are the traditional terms of American foreign policy that Obama didn't see the world with, and Biden doesn't see, the Biden people, Biden administration didn't see the world with. Hmm. The Biden administration sees the world as a system and as themselves as the managers of a system. We're gonna talk about that later. But uh, the Trump, Trump administration saw it in a very traditional terms. They want less engagement in the Middle East. So what the Trump administration did is that it went to the US allies in the Middle East and said, you need to do more. Hmm. And that's exactly more. You need, you need to pay more. You need to do yeah. more for yeah. your own security. And that's exactly the space in which the Emiratis and the Bahrainis and the Saudis stepped in and the Abraham Accords came out. True. So, so you had support for Israel. We're going to maintain our traditional alliances. 
with Israel, get traditional alliances with the Arab states. Uh, but you guys need to do more, and, and you got the Abraham Accords. The Arabs were very happy, the Israelis were very happy with this, the Arabs were very happy with this. That means that they can now work together and do provide some a, a, a regional structure that can provides a platform whether for security cooperation for the region in order to deter Iran and the mm -hmm. anti-American camp, the anti-Arab camp, the anti-Israeli camp, the Axis. Uh, a, a platform uh, where they can actually compete and collaborate for the economic uh, prosperity of the region and so on and so forth. So that was very successful. Uh, but then, of course, you had a new worldview that came with the with the Biden administration mm. um, that was already very hostile to everything that the Trump administration had done or said. Um, and it already came with a, with a different worldview. I think the best book that people should read if they want to understand how the Biden uh, administration's foreign policy and worldview were developed is a book that was published actually last, Feb last February yeah. uh, by Democrat, Democratic insiders. It's not a polemical book at all. Uh, it's by Alexander Ward. It's called The Internationalists, mm. which also I think is a funny title. It might as well be exactly. called The Globalists. I don't know. Yeah. But that's exactly how the Biden administration saw itself. Yeah, and, and it was also perceived in a very negative way in the Arab world. I remember when, on the first week of the Biden administration, when his first, one of his very, very early decisions yeah. was to remove the Houthi from the list of foreign terrorist organizations, yeah. was really shocking to the Arab allies who were doing their best to win the support of the United States, like yeah. the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain and most of the Gulf countries. So yeah. it's uh, it was not also seen in a good way in the region. But because he's going back to Iran. This is the, this is the thing. This yeah. is the thing which I think we need like a whole episode to discuss about Iran and how it really represents threat not only to Israel but to the Arabs too. I think this is something we need to really highlight. But the big question now is, what should we do next? What 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 should happen to? close this gap, or at least narrow this gap between the American misperceptions about the Middle East and the Middle East misperceptions about the United States and turn it into a cooperative, um, a cooperative relationship between the two sides. Whenever you have an issue of perception and misperception, the solution is always communications. Mm -hmm. um, the United States needs to listen to both the Arab, what Arabs and Israelis are saying. It's it's very rare. It's been very rare when Arabs and Israelis are saying the same thing. I think you you know you need to start listening. There is today a united voice of Arabs and Israelis together, who are formulating, a, as I said, a vision for the region in the same way, objectives, strategic objectives for themselves and and for the United States. Um, uh, in the same way, and uh, and their interests in the same way. And I think it's very important to listen to these voices. And it's also important for us to highlight this point because everyone is now looking at the Middle East as a place of conflicts where everyone is killing everyone. But actually the fact that we exist here today, we are talking here today from a platform that's the Jerusalem Center for Foreign Affairs, we are Arabs and Israelis working together, is just a message and we are not alone as you know there are many people like us in the region who are just waiting for the opportunity to work together Arabs and Israelis side by side but they just don't have the channels to do that through so the fact that we exist here today we're talking about all of this today I think is the first step toward this narrowing this gap between the perceptions of the US and the Middle East I think, I think that's, that's true and that's why we have this podcast to try to provide this new perspective um, on the Middle East that takes the interests of both Israelis and the Arabs uh, together because it sees the region ultimately uh, as a place in which everybody uh, is meant uh, to share, everybody will have uh, a place in. That's wow, it. as I said, it's, the topic is very, is very big, very complicated. It's, it should take more than 30 minutes, I guess. So let's plan to discuss more in the next we, episode. We will. We will discuss more, but that's it for today. Thank you for tuning in. Um, we know that there are many people who want to join in these discussions um, about the better future of the Middle East. So subscribe, engage, reach out. Um, and if you like what we do, consider supporting us uh, through JCPA. Uh, that org. Thank you. Thank you.